Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining. Um, my name is Tierra Thomas. I'm CWRU class of 2012, and I'm also president of the African American Alumni Association. And it is my pleasure to welcome you all tonight to our Profiles of Inclusive Excellence. The African American Alumni Association of CWRU was officially established in October 2009, and our purpose is to support provide support and networking opportunities for African-American alumni of CWRU. We work to provide a forum for the university to recruit students and foster friendship among those connected with the university. Before we begin, begin today's program, just a few housekeeping notes. One, everyone is gonna be muted by default. Please remain muted to limit background noise during the program. However, if you have any questions, please utilize the chat feature and we will do our best to get those answered for you. Two, so that we know who you are, we welcome you to rename yourself by clicking on participants and, and then finding your name and then using the more option and then you can select rename so we know who you are. Finally, if you can, we ask that you please turn on your video because we'd like to see your smiling faces. Um, and with that, I'm happy to welcome you to this installment of Profiles of Inclusive Excellence, a virtual series in collaboration with the African-American Alumni Association the Office of Inclusion, Diversity, and Equal Opportunity, and the African and African American Studies Program to highlight the work and research of our African American faculty. Our host for the evening is going to be Dr. Heather Burton. Um, she's Associate Vice President and Senior Director for Faculty and Institutional Diversity with CWRU, specializing in gender and racial equity. And with that, I gladly turn it over to Dr. Burton. Thank you, Tierra. Thank you so much. Um, and welcome to everyone. Welcome to our Profiles of Inclusive Excellence series. Um, we are excited tonight because we have the infamous, the intelligent, the exciting, <laughs> one of our faculty who have been with us for a while at Case Western Reserve University. And I'm honored to say that she's also one of my soror to all the members of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated who are on the call this evening. I see a few faces uh, that um, we are happy to have Dr. Faye Gary with us. And um, I, I told Dr. Gary that this, what we do with Profiles of Excellence is it's really about learning about Dr. Gary, not only just with the research, but also who is Dr. Gary? You know, many of you on this call are probably supporters of Dr. Gary in terms of work, in terms of programming and different things that uh, she, how she has touched your lives throughout her uh, time here with Case Western Reserve. And, and so kind of Dr. Geary, uh, what we do to begin the Profiles of Inclusive Excellence is we have a, a theme uh, that we do with Profiles of Excellence. And if you're familiar with the movie or anyone on the call is familiar with the movie Brown Sugar, you can remember um, Tay Diggs and Sanai Lathan. And, and in the, what, the question that was always asked was, when did you fall in love with hip hop? And so what we do with Profiles of Excellence is we kind of tweak that question and we ask the person, when did they fall in love with their academic discipline? And so Dr. Gary, to get us going and get us talking, the question that I pose to you is, when did you fall in love with nursing? Oh, well, I thank you. That's a very interesting question and one that it's rather easy to uh, answer. Uh, as you may know, I grew up in the rural South and uh, I lived on a farm and uh, we had animals. We had chickens and goats and cows and pigs. And there were five of us, four girls and a boy, my mother and my father and my grandfather. And so with the farm, it's always all hands on deck. So we have to take care of the animals and animals got sick and we were very attentive to them. So I learned the value of life. I learned the value of feeling well. I learned the value of open spaces and food and rest and respect for uh, nature um, and the environment at a very early age. And I was taught by other people in the rural area. I was frequently by my brothers and sisters, my brother and my sisters called the country bumpkin because I love the farm, I love the environment and the people who care for it and who respect 
nature and the wonderful creation that has unfolded before us that we are responsible for taking care of. And unfortunately, I do not think we always do a good job, but nevertheless, uh, we should be servants of our fellow man and also the environment. So it was very easy to make a linkage from animals to people as a nurse. Yes. So what was it though that did made you not go into a uh, veterinary uh, with, with that practice, especially since you had such a love for animals? Well, I still do, but I also have a love for people. And in my environment, people got sick did not have access to health care. The health literacy was uh, relatively low. Uh, I saw a lot of human suffering that could have been prevented if people had had access to just basic, basic health care, unintentional injuries, et cetera, et cetera. So I think I shifted from animals to people because the level of human suffering uh, has always been something that was very um, generic in my life, sensitive to me, and something that I thought I could do, uh, make a difference in. And that's how I chose nursing, to relieve I, human suffering. I love it, to relieve human suffering. And, and, and with that, when you think about human suffering, what are some of the things that you see now that are still that you're still passionate about, and especially around human suffering, some of the work that you do, just life experiences? Well, I would say that, of course, you might know that my specialty is behavioral health, child psychiatric nursing. I believe that if we take care of children, if we could just invest in an ounce of prevention, we would certainly uh, alleviate a lot of pain and suffering. I think that adverse childhood experiences are so prevalent among our children, among our very eyes, in all settings across the world, but also right here in Cleveland. I saw it when I was working and living on a farm. We still have our farm, I go back, I still see people who have not had access to a decent education and decent health care are bound to experience more suffering and hardship than those of us who've been privileged to have some basic health care and a decent education. I must add that I think of all of the variables where we can invest our time, energy, and effort in human beings and the environment, I look at education, quality education, and quality health care. And if we have quality education and quality health care, I think we can build sustainable communities. We can have uh, better universities, more diverse universities. Uh, we can have economic security. And when we have economic security, I think we will also uh, have better built communities and more opportunities to dialogue with people across race, ethnicity, religion, geography, geography, et cetera, et cetera. So for me, the basis of human existence is quality education and quality health care. Nevertheless, I think those kinds of issues are so difficult for us to come to terms with and to have any kind of consistent policy and investment. I agree. I agree that it is very hard to come to terms when we're talking about quality education and, and health care and finding fair and equitable spaces, opportunities uh, to put that. It's it's a fight. Well, you know, Dr. Gary, we do this fight on a regular basis <laughs> is that we're, we're pushing against so many um so many negative aspects that have affected us as uh, as a community. Yes. I want to I want to go back just a little bit. And what is what I heard you say farm. I heard you say you go back and visit sometimes. Where is going back to? Well, I go back as often as I can. And my home uh, is in Ocala, Florida, and it's in north central Florida. Uh, it's about 40 miles from the 40 miles south of the University of Florida. 
And I must add, during my formative years, we were close to, but did not have access to an institution such as the University of Florida because of the Jim Crow laws of the South. So it was there, but not for me. But not for you. And so, and, and so with that, how do you think your childhood has impacted who you are today? I think in my rural community, we did not have much money, but we had a stable community. We had individuals who had a united effort, not only within our families, but also across our communities to try and make things better for each other. One thing that if you have share, scarce resources, in order to survive, you have to share and you have to communicate and you need to respect each other. And whenever opportunities arise, we shared with each other and everybody uh, got behind and supported the youth and the community to get an education, to go to school every day and to remain healthy. Now the healthy part was to work hard and go to bed and get a good night's rest. That was health and to have a decent, meal. And because we lived in the rural community, I would just like to share with you that all of my formative life, I ate uncaged eggs and uncaged chickens. <laughs> and they were not labeled as such. It was just labeled as farm supplies. All right. of us ate uncaged chickens. And they probably were not $8.99 uh, um, a, a dozen like they are now. <laughs> no, it was the ones that grew. we grew ourselves. Yes. Uh, I know many people now are thinking about how can I create, how can I have my own chickens and get my own eggs because of the cost of, of groceries, specifically eggs, when we talk about that. I was listening to you say that when you think about health or your health, and, and thinking about it was going to bed early, eating well. How do you think that definition has shifted? Well, I think there's so many uh, barriers that enter, and I'm gonna talk about not only adults, but children, because I spend most of my life working with children. I think social media has made a profound impact on all of our lives. And for children, I think that it's it has expanded their day and not always a healthy way. Uh, the social media that is used among many children is used in an indiscriminate manner, not necessarily for education and not necessarily for healthy interpersonal relationships. Nevertheless, they are heavily engaged in the social media and they go to bed with their phones, they wake up with their phones, they are sleep deprived, and in many instances, families are so busy and so stressed that they never get a chance to get meals that are cooked at home. But I think uh, the kinds of commercial foods that we have, uh, children enjoy. And even when they get a chance to have a home cooked meal, they would rather have McDonald's fries. Mm. So I think these kinds of structures that have changed in our society have set about a different kind of value, a different way that we perceive time, that we utilize time, especially time with family and friends and community. Because I could share with you a community is any place that I have the capacity to connect with. Right. And that's through social media. So my, commu my community is however I wish to describe it and for how long I wish to participate. And children do not always get adequate supervision about the use of their cell phones and other kinds of social media. And I must add that adults sometimes have difficulty setting limits with that for themselves as well. We need to monitor ourselves with regard to social media and make sure that we get proper rest as well. And I agree with you wholeheartedly. And I'm that adult, Dr. Gary. I'm that adult. <laughs> <laughs> who struggle sometimes to put the phone down. But yes. you'll be, you be proud of me. I'm doing much better these days. Wonderful. Of my cell phone and, and especially with social media. And not only that, just answering email, emails. And, and I think that, um, like you said, it, it affects our health and affects everything else. And so with that, what would you tell 
those that are in our audience that has children that are working with children and that how do you how do you help them what's your advice to help them navigate this world of social media right now well i i would say that uh, we just need to have some simple guidelines nothing complex uh, I think there should be a time when we use the phones and other forms of social media, and there should be a time when we cut it off, we plug it up, we rest it, we leave it downstairs, and we go upstairs to the to uh, go to bed and to rest. Social media is not something that we should use to engage our lives with for 24 hours. It is a very unhealthy way in terms of um uh, getting REM sleep and children don't grow unless they experience REM sleep. I think just looking at your phone all the time, whether your child or an adult increases the stress. And also we've set an expectation that the response should be instant. And I think we can break that cycle ourselves. Don't depend on someone else to do that. But having uh, some general guidelines in the home about watching TV, uh, how many hours a week? Now, I have four sons. And during the time that my sons were young, the rule in the house was we did not watch TV during the week. We watched TV Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and even those programs were controlled. Now, they did not like that then. But now they thank me for that because they got proper rest. They read their books. We cannot allow our children to... Uh, substitute books for social media. We cannot allow our children to substitute doing homework, math, and writing essays for social media, for TikTok. TikTok won't get us where we need to be, but writing essays, doing our math homework, doing our chemistry, our biology, and reading uh, uh, biographical sketches about people is how we move the thinking, the critical thinking, the discipline. And I must say that everything that I have said does require some self-discipline. And we need to focus, myself included, on self-discipline and teaching our children about self-discipline. And the regulation and control of drives and impulses for oneself. Because that is what ex is expected of them in this world. Mm -hmm. I I agree, and I am listening to you when you uh, listen to you when you talked about your sons, and you would be happy to know that I get eight hours of sleep just about every night, Doctor Gary. I love sleep. If someone takes that from me, I'm going to be highly upset. Uh, but when you know you you talk about your love for children, and we know that that you love students. And so I want to touch on the Provost Scholars Program. How did that idea generate? Where did that come from? Well, I think that must have come from years of working in different settings. Uh, I've worked uh, with uh, Native American children. I've worked in state hospitals. I've worked in public schools. I've worked in psychiatric clinics. And by the way, I'm a former superintendent of my Sunday school. And I also taught ethics at a detention center in Marion County for about 15 years. So it is a conglomeration of seeing the needs of children. I think all children have the same basic needs, just like all human beings do. Unfortunately, there are so many children who become casualties because they don't get their needs met even at a very minimal level of love, of caring, of uh, proper housing, of discipline, of education, of health care. And like sometimes uh, I've had a child who told me, Dr. Gary, I have nobody to go and cry to. I have no one to cry to. And that means I have no one in my life who cares for me and who will be my advocate along this very rough journey. Uh, at the detention center, the children would sing a song, and the title of the song, some of you might know it, but they would sing a song, and the title of the song is, uh, uh, I'm Climbing Up on the Rough Side of the Mountain. And that 
uh, those kinds of lyrics let you know the struggles that children have. And so in my position, I have been able to develop networks to inform adults who did have the capacity to help in intellectual and resource ways so that we can provide some assistance. In Marion County, my home, we developed a program where someone was at the detention facilities every night. Someone was teaching sculpture, another was teaching music, another was tutoring, another was reading funnies to the children because we learned something as basic as reading the funnies to the children. The children did not know how to extract the humor from the funny paper. So we had a person who did that. In other words, we used any resource that a, a, an adult who was interested in investing in the children uh, had, and we would plan for them to go to the detention center to help uh, the youth at the detention center. So when I came to Cleveland, after working at the University of Florida for most of my professional year, years, uh, I looked at these communities and I saw a much larger scale of uh, humanity that needed attention, but I saw the same issues, but the, the scope and the magnitude was very different. And uh, I was on a committee with the former provost uh, base life. And uh, I thought that our committee should do more. So I went to him and I asked him about having a partnership with East Cleveland. And he was very receptive to it. And he said, write up a paper or uh, a concept paper or something and tell me what you want to do. And I did. And he said to me, uh, well, I'm not so sure it's how, how it's going to work, but I'm going to support you in your efforts to do it. And I must say that he didn't know me well, and I didn't know him very well, but we connected because we had a common goal to help children and families in under-resourced communities. And uh, I would also say that when I came to Case Western Reserve University, uh, I don't think it was my idea. I think the idea was already here. I just think I helped to coordinate and highlight that idea because the kinds of support that I've gotten from mentors, from tutors, from administrators, from deans, from the president is just unbelievably overwhelming. So I would say, that I just pulled things together, but all of the ingredients were already here at Case Western Reserve University. So where would you wanna see the Provo Scholars Program go? Well, we want to expand it. We have a toolkit, we have ideas, we have ideals, and we've begun to do that. We had planned to expand it to several other universities in the greater Cleveland area where those universities will replicate our program and provide support for other schools in the greater Cleveland area. And of course, COVID stopped that. But just about two weeks ago, I had a conversation with the provost, along with the associate director of the program, Dr. Lee Thompson, who's also uh, the associate dean in the School of Arts and Sciences. And, um, is a phenomenal support, uh, visionary. So, uh, and she and I say that we can go from A to Z in a half second. So if A won't work, we can do B, C, D all the way to Z in a half second. In other words, we're gonna make it work. And she's just a wonderful, wonderful colleague to work with, along with the other mentors in our program. Uh, I don't think there's ever been a time when I've asked a mentor to assist with a particular issue with the child, be it homelessness, a child who's failing uh, a class, a child who needs a coat, or a child who needs a ride, or a family who uh, needs some other kinds of resources so that they can thrive. We always get a resounding yes. So I've come to the right place for the Provost Scholars Program. 
And it's really not me. It's all of the people at Case Western to include our president and our provost, past and former, and the deans that I work with and the dean of the School of Nursing uh, who uh, allows me to do this program. That's uh, Dr. Uh, Carol Musil. And I must say that uh, Dean May Weichel was the dean who recruited me here. And I promised her three years. And now in July, I would have been here for 20 years. So Case Western Reserve University was just the right place for me. And I thank Dean Weichel for being um, uh, tolerant of me because it took me a while to leave sunny Florida where there were swaying palm trees and sandy beaches <laughs> to come where it snows and people have to wear coats and hats half the year. Right, right. And I'm going to come back to the hat because you told me an interesting fact about the hat. But I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, if you want to ask Dr. Gary a question, I will be taking questions from the chat. So you're more than welcome to put your questions in the chat and um, we will screen those and take questions from our chat. If you have any questions for Dr. Gary, what brought you to Cleveland? Well, Dean Weichel. Uh, she and I served on one or two national committees together. I'd never been to Cleveland and I did not know her, but we ended up on uh, national, the National Institutes of Health Committees. And I liked her and I liked her reasoning. And um, she and I would have sidebars together and she was the dean and she said, you know, I have an endowed chair and uh, based on your comments and your contributions to this committee, I think you're the perfect fit for the chair. And I said, are you asking me to come to Cleveland? No. And she said, well, you think about it in her own gentle way. You think about it. And if you were to come to Case Western Reserve University, you would be amazed at what you find in terms of the intellect, in terms of the kind of diversity of thought in the faculty. I think you would like it there. And so after I had decided I was going to come, I would say, Dean, Dean Michael, I cannot come unless I have an office with lots of windows. And she said, you got it. And after I had made that promise, I had to come. <laughs> and sit in your office with a lot of windows. <laughs> I have a lot of windows. <laughs> uh so what was one of your biggest challenges in coming here, especially because you did your you did part of your education, am I correct, at Florida A&M? Yes, I'm a graduate of Florida A&M University, which is an HBCU. Yes. Um, and uh, I'm still I serve on an advisory committee. Uh, but in the state of Florida, during my formative years, there were three institutions, uh, three public institutions the University of Florida, which initially was for white males, but became co-ed. Then it was uh, Florida State University in Tallahassee, which initially was for white females. And about six blocks away was my beloved Florida A&M University, which was marketed as the university for Florida's Negro citizens. Mm -hmm. And of course, that was the category that I fitted in. Florida's Negro citizens. So that's what I went to school. And so with 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 that, you went to University of Florida to teach first and then here. Well, I went to Chicago. Chicago. Uh, when I got ready to get a master's degree after I finished, well, I couldn't get a job. I was too educated with the BS degree, so I couldn't get a job. So I went to Syracuse and I worked and that was the first time I ever touched a white patient because things were so segregated that you didn't, I took care of black patients as a student nurse. And after I uh, uh, graduated, then your case though would be black people, not white people. So I went to Syracuse and it was cold there, but I, I enjoyed the university and I left. And I ended up being accepted at uh, St. Xavier University, which was at my time an all women's Irish Catholic college. So I was in an environment where in South Chicago, where I was the only black person on the entire campus and probably the only non-Catholic. 
And I said to myself, if they are willing to teach me, by golly, I'm staying. Hmm. And I graduated with honors, the first one to graduate and the first person out of my class to get a doctorate. And it's one of the best decisions that I've ever made because they didn't have any, any programs about diversity, nothing about inclusion. They just treated me like a human being. That's all. And that's all it really requires. And that's it. That's all it requires. But that's powerful that you're saying, you know, with if they were willing to teach, you were willing to learn. Absolutely. And I think that's uh, a hindrance that we have very often, especially when we end up being the one. The only is because we deal with so many different facets of microaggressions, bias, uh, isms, that it pushes us away that we forget what our main purpose is and what our dream is of obtaining education. So what you just said, I think is powerful for anyone on this call that's actually dealing with that being the only in the space is that if I'm here, I'm here to learn and I'm going to learn in spite of the obstacles and barriers that confront me. And my teachers taught me when I made a mistake, they corrected me. They didn't think it was cute. And sometimes I hear people say, oh, that's so cute. They didn't say it was cute because what they would tell me is that you, in order to be productive in this life, you're going to have to have uh, decent English. You're going to have to know how to write. You're going to have to have good social emotional behaviors. They were just honest with me. And I appreciated that. They were all so kind and gentle and they didn't push me aside. I participated in every activity at the school. And on the weekends, I was with my classmates who I didn't have a car. They'd pick me up. We'd go to church together. We'd go to dinner. So I was very well integrated into that society. And I felt uh, a very genuine kind of acceptance. And when graduation came, I was the only one of my classmates who cried. And uh, they were saying, now, Faye, as hard as we worked, why in the world are you crying at graduation? But they did not understand that I had had a corrective emotional experience about how human beings could interact with, care for, respect each other, despite our differences. All of them were Caucasian. Uh, not all were Catholic, but most were Catholic. Few of them had come from the rural South, and almost all of them had gone to private schools. So I was oddballed out in many ways, but I also learned that I could think as well as they could. And they reinforced that, that I learned that despite the lack of opportunity, if I were to focus on my work, I too could make A's, that their intellect was no better than mine, that opportunity was the only difference. And that's what I believe today, that we provide opportunity for people, they'll soar with eagles. But what we have done in our society is to control opportunity, and therefore that is indeed oppression. Yes, uh, control opportunity equals oppression. Say it again, Dr. Gary, control <laughs> opportunity equals oppression. And, and, and if we look at it that way, and I think hearing your story, you see the differences that you say, you know, the individuals that supported you, they treated you as a human. Whereas now within society, it's shifted where this idea of I'm controlling every space. And even I shared this the other day with a, with a group is that we love to say we're allies until we feel like we're losing something. That's and right. as soon as we lose something, we jump ship because it's controlling the situation so that I win. And it's it's causing too many issues. And I think this kind of goes to uh, the question that we have in the chat where uh, Jalise Thomas is asking, what advice would you give to a researcher that's interested in entering the health disparities or health, equi e health equity research space? Where should they start? Uh, what should they be prepared for? I think you have to be prepared. You have to prepare yourself as an excellent thinker, 
You have to understand where your passion lies. You also must know that health disparities covers every creature, creed. Health disparities occur all over the world, and it is across the life course. And so when you begin to think about what your particular area will be, start with uh, what I say start uh, from a broad base and then narrow that down based on what you think you're most interested in and where your greater capabilities are. Because I tell people, uh, given the disparities across the life course, anything you do well is accepted, appreciated, and is potentially impactful. Anything you do well across the life course with any group of people, the field is wide open. And so I say, examine yourself and know who you are, where your passion is, and then persevere. Nothing is easy. You're going to have to work hard. There is no, sh my mother used to say to us and my, I have three sisters, and all of my sisters have doctorate degrees. Uh, and uh, she used to say, hey, baby, there are no shortcuts. And I say to them, you don't choose something because you anticipate a shortcut. Otherwise, you're going to be disappointed. Choose because you're willing to persevere. Choose because you have the intellectual capacity and the emotional uh, compassion to follow that. And don't worry about failing. If you fail, get up. Mandela said that your character is based on getting up, not falling, but getting up after you've fallen. So uh, you need to have the research methodology and you need to have, uh, you need to know what your variables are, et cetera, et cetera. You can learn that. But focusing on yourself and how you think you can develop a program. I, instead of calling it a program of research, I would prefer to call it a program of intervention in, uh, in human suffering. And stick with that. It could be the detention center. It could be Native American reservation. It could be your neighbor next door. So you look at programs for intervention to improve the human condition. And in academia, you have to do that in a systematic manner. I do understand that. But it has to be for a purpose. It cannot be for your tenure. It needs to be greater than a person's tenure or greater than a p-value. We're talking about human beings. And we're talking about billions of human beings who have never had a clean cup of water. Think about that's the mission is to relieve the human suffering wherever and however you can. Relieving human suffering. Uh, Jalise, I hope Dr. Gary answered your question for you. Yes, she says, thank you, Dr. Gary. Incredibly powerful. Dr. Gary, what, um, when you think, what, what do you enjoy most about your work? Uh, interacting with the children and uh, seeing a glint of uh, hope come to them when they think it's all despair, uh, preventing the despair from ever happening in a child's life. I tell, I just uh, completed teaching a class in health policy and I shared with my students that uh, Lyndon, the late Lyndon B. Johnson, who was at one time an elementary school teacher and he taught on the border of Texas and Mexico, he made the observation and it's so very true. He wasn't a, he wasn't a psychiatric nurse or psychiatrist or social worker or psychologist, but he said by the developmentally, by the time the poor children were in fourth grade, he saw the light go out of their eyes. He saw the curiosity fade away. And believe it or not, that is a part of the experience that helped him to develop uh, the great society where his effort was to eradicate poverty. So it was those experiences with children that helped to develop policy that not only the United States benefited from, but the entire world did. 
So I would say, uh, if you can prevent human suffering, if you can redirect a child or an individual, then I think that's what brings me the greatest joy, or to redirect them just for a moment, just for a moment of happiness, a moment of looking at uh, reality uh, in a very different way. Because you have to, well, I think, and uh, and I hope others do too, that the rea- understanding your reality is the basis of your survival. And from your reality comes judgment based on what you see and think and feel is how you make your decisions and the way you take action. And that's what we call judgment. And so I try to help people restructure their reality in a way that's beneficial for them and to remove uh, the self-doubt, uh, the oppression that they and others have heaped upon themselves. I love it. Remove the self-doubt. We, we need more individuals like you who are helping to remove the self-doubt in, in, in our young people. Because if we remove their self-doubt, we can they can see what all they can accomplish. What is it that Dr. Gary likes to do? Uh, well, when I'm home, I cook. And that's an interesting question because during my formative years in high school, which also was segregated, Black children had to take uh, a lot of credits in home economics. And so I had four years of home economics. And at one time I could cook anything. Um, I'm sort of, I'm not, I'm at the computer a lot now, so I'm not doing a whole lot of cooking except when I go home. But I enjoy cooking. Uh, and I also uh, enjoy uh, walking and looking at the trees and uh, doing bird watching. And uh, uh, I enjoy, at one time at my home, I had many, many orange trees and a cold came and killed them, but I enjoy planting trees. And uh, uh, I think trees are some of the most beautiful creations, and they are all over the world. God used the same pattern, and but shaped them somewhat differently all over the world. So I love trees, and when I'm home, I plant trees, and I hoe around trees, and uh, I love the outdoors. I love the birds. I love the snakes and the spiders and the frogs, and it all fits together to create a wonderful world. Yes, God's harmony and everything that God created. I love it. I love it, Dr. Gary. What's your what's your favorite thing to cook? Uh, I think my signature. Now I don't know how, my if my siblings are listening, they might uh, disagree. But one of my signature pieces is making good dressing at Christmas and Thanksgiving. And we make it like we did at home and we use cornbread and all of the other kinds of pieces that you get from a farm. And so um, I would say making dressing and turkey and uh, uh, I used to make lots of cakes. I used to be the cake maker at my home when I was growing up. You see, I learned all of this when I was in high school because uh, I was supposed to be a cook and a mate. I just missed my calling. Well, we're glad you missed your calling, <laughs> and we're glad that you we're glad that you're the Dr. Gary that we know, and not the Dr. Gary. Unless you were going to be Dr. Gary like on the Food Network, then that would have been completely different. <laughs> but we're that's glad not that what the folks said in my back home. <laughs> <laughs> and I get it. I'm the baker of the family too, Dr. Gary. And I learned in home ec class. Absolutely. We had home ec class where I first learned how to cook. Well, one of the early introductions, I say I learned how to cook at home. Absolutely. But I, and I, one of the things I always remember is turning the handles of pots in. That was like one of the first lessons that you never have the pots turned out. They have to be turned in and away from the out of the stove so you don't knock them off. But that's right. And you close your cabinet doors when you get the items up. Yes, yes. <laughs> the, the, the small things that you take for granted um, of that, that many people don't learn, especially when it comes to cooking. Well, there is a question in the chat. How did your preparation 
At FAMU, stand you in good stead for your later professional experiences at Syracuse, St. Xavier, and University of Florida? Well, I think that's a very interesting question because, you see, during my era, I had nothing else to compare it with. Our lives were centered around Black communities, the Black church. We had a few Black stores. Uh, our interactions with white people was on the weekend when we went to the five and dime to buy some notebook paper or some ribbons or whatever else we got from the five and dime. So it was very, very limited. So all of my formative years were shaped by people who look like me. Uh, but we would talk about other people. We would talk about how their lives must be. Uh, and for a long time, I must confess that I did not think white people had any problems. They always seemed to have a car. The girls and the boys could go to the five and dime and have a, a, have a banana split, and I couldn't. I had to pass by. So I didn't think they had any problems. They had a hospital, and we had two little rooms. And it was at FAMU uh, that I learned that the human condition is one that impacts everybody's lives. Uh, I read it from books. I learned it from my other classmates who come from all over the state of Florida. But the other thing that happened there was that uh, we didn't talk about blackness so much. We were blackness. Mm -hmm. We talked about excellence. We had excellent teachers. Uh, we had an excellent band. We had an excellent football team. And our, our drama team toured the world because they were excellent. Uh, our nursing students, the president would get up uh, at the convocation and he would talk about the nursing students always present with purpose. And that was Dr. George W. Gore. He said the nursing students always presented with purpose. When we walked across the campus, we had a purpose. We were going to the library, we were going to uh, the hospital uh, of a class. So I learned about excellence and that was reinforced. Uh, my classmates became colonels and lieutenant colonels and presidents and physicians and uh, nurses and lawyers. And we came from what we call, we came from a situation where every obstacle was put in our way. But we persevered and we knew that we could achieve excellence. And we were told that we were as good as anybody at any place. And we were, fortunately, we believed it. We believed that we were as good as anyone, any place. That's what we were, that was, and one day, we will be able to interact with other people across the world community. And we used to laugh at our our faculty members when they would say that because we thought it was such a far-fetched idea. But they would say, hold on, children. Learn your lesson now because your excellence will be needed in this troubled world. They, were, I, they had great vision. And we also, most of us went to church service around the, the local community churches, and they we were very active presidents of student bodies. We had all kinds of clubs. So at FAMU, there were many, many opportunities uh, to have leadership, to take responsibility for projects. Uh, and of course, I joined Delta Sigma Theta. I pledged when I was 17. So uh, I was very clear about what my purpose would be. And when I got there, I'd never seen such a collection of such industrious, focused, smart women. And I said, I must become one of them. So did I, Dr. Gary. <laughs> <laughs> so did I. I said the same thing. And I knew from ninth grade, I probably would have been highly disappointed if Ohio State did not have Deltas when I got there. But um, I agree, it was just uh, the epitome of intelligent women. And someone actually complimented you in the chat with those same words, that you're the epitome of excellence. Uh, we are wrapping up our time. Um, we are actually coming down. But there's one question that I would like to ask from the chat. And 
The, uh, someone's asking for volunteer opportunities. If you're aware of any volunteer opportunities in Cleveland that you would recommend for working with detained youth. Well, you tell them to call me because we are looking for volunteers for the Provo Scholars Program. We need volunteers now. And as we expand our program, we can provide them with whatever their heart wishes in terms of volunteering with children and youth and also family members. I'm also a member of the East Cleveland's uh, Concerned Pastors. I'm an honorary member. And so I link with the uh, faith community so they can call me, they can call Dr. Thompson, and we will have them on the job next week. And, that, and, and Dr. Gary, we'll have you on the job next week. So, uh, and always looking for mentors and volunteers to uh, reach out to Dr. Gary. You can reach Dr. Gary. Um, Dr. Gary, you wanna provide your contact, your email? fgary at case.edu. fgary at case.edu. Again, fgary at case.edu is a way to reach out uh, to Dr. Gary. Before we wrap things up, Dr. Gary, I will tell you that Reverend Murda is on the call and sends greetings from Mount Zion AME Church. Uh, so and that's where I was superintendent of church. I started ushering at the church when I was 10 years old. And at my house with my mother and father, on Monday through Friday, you went to school. And on Sunday, you went to church. And on and Saturday, you needed to get yourself together so you could be ready for Monday through Friday and Sunday. Yes, and get yourself together on Saturday and prepare for church. Dr. Gary, I want you to share with the listening audience the hat. When I first saw Dr. Gary on this call, and you all have to admit, Dr. Gary is sharp tonight. <laughs> um, that hat was just doing something for me. I don't know if it's doing something for anybody else, but it was doing something for me. And so, Dr. Gary, just share about the hat with our listening audience. Well, I'm one of five children, four sisters and a brother. And uh, one of my sisters gave my mother this hat some years ago, and somehow I inherited it. So it's my mother's hat. My mother was uh, a dynamite lady. She was very tiny, but she was, I think, a brilliant woman who she and my father managed to send 11 children to college, five of us and and five who, uh, and the other six who uh, were not. But she worked all of her life to educate us and other children. She also taught first grade for years and years. And she was a master teacher. And I must tell you the story that my mother taught in the black schools. And when the schools were integrated, her competency came under question. And that was very painful for her. And her, her principal said, now we will see how excellent you are. And a few years later, he came to her and he apologized. And he said, Miss Gary, you are phenomenal. You are a phenomenal teacher. But that's some of the kinds of oppressions that people of color, and I don't know if you call that a, uh, a microaggression. That's not too micro for me. Uh, but uh, my mother could uh, raise above all of that and to tell us, whatever it is, you need to think that you're excellent and persevere. So she thought she was excellent. And so the principal's commentary uh, was simply a comment. That's it. And in the words of Ibram Kendi, everything is a microabuse uh, when it's not positive. Dr. Geary, do you have any last words for the listening audience before I close us out and turn things back over to Tierra? Well, I would like to say that it's one of my pleasures to be a part of my colleagues, the structure and the community here at Case Western Reserve University and to work with all of you all. And again, uh, it's not me that makes the difference. It's you who makes the difference with the Provo Scholars Program. And it's you who put the wings, put the wind under my wings. And for that, I'm most grateful. 
We thank you, Dr. Gary, and we thank you for all the work that you do at Case Western Reserve University and for being a pillar and for being a pillar within the Black community and not only the Black community of Cleveland, but specifically the Black community at Case Western Reserve University and how you work to help to push diversity, equity, and inclusion, not only within the nursing school, but across the university and across the city. So we thank you for all that you've done. Um, I thank you all for tuning in. And I thank, of course, my supervisor who's on the call tonight, Vice President Robert Solomon, the Office for Inclusion, Diversity, and Equal Opportunity, our African and African-American Studies minor, and our African-American Alumni Association. Thank everyone for the partnership that we have and being able to highlight our Black faculty on campus. It's such an honor and an experience. Uh, when I first started in this role, one of the things that was said to me is that we, we don't have Black faculty. And I said, well, that's interesting because I meet quite a few on a regular basis. And so as I began to meet, to talk, I, I went to the Alumni Association and I asked for this opportunity to do this profiles. And so we're in our third year now and we have not repeated a black faculty yet. Now, let me say that doesn't mean that we have enough. That just means that we have some that are doing some great work on our campus. We know that our demographics still need to change and we know that we still need to increase our numbers with black faculty, but we do have faculty on our campus that are doing tremendous work within the Cleveland community and the Case Western Reserve community. And so I will turn things back over to Tierra for our final words and thank every thank everyone for attending. attending. Thank you so much, Heather. And again, thank you all for joining us, um, Dr. Gary. Thank you so much. That was just absolutely phenomenal. I leave this space so inspired by the work that you've done and just so incredibly blown away. Um, so again, thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, a special thank you to Dr. Gary. A thank you to Heather in the Office of Inclusion, um, Diversity and Equal Opportunity. We hope that you will join us for our next profile of inclusive excellence. And that will be February 15th with Dr. Melvin Smith. Um, so we hope that you are able to join us for that. More information should be coming and hitting your inboxes if it has not already. Of course, you could always find more information about the African-American Alumni Association at case.edu slash alumni. And you can find us on social media. Um, we are on Facebook. If you search Case Western Reserve University, African American Alumni Association. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for joining us again. We hope you have a wonderful night. And thank you again. <laughs>